All right, today we're going to talk about include files, and we're going to talk about um, the benefits of them and how they can be used really to um, make your pages more maintainable. Again, more maintainable is always one of our big goals as far as any sort of software development, and no less in web development. <clears throat> so these include files help us do that. And we're going to start out by extending the example that we had last time where we were doing the currency conversion. If you remember last time, we put the code that does the currency conversion into a function. And that allowed us to that allowed us to call it from any place we wanted to on the page. And even though we didn't do it, we could then call that those functions several times within the same page. Because we've taken and we've taken that chunk of code, we've made a function out of it, we've given the function arguments, so we've given it the parameters that it needs to do its job, and the functions have their return values, which means that they return the result to whoever called them. So we could call that function over and over within that same page. The problem is, is oftentimes we want to call that function over and over on different pages. And for that we need include files. So let me go and bring these in. So to review where we left off last time, and then continue on. methods that we have here, the functions that we have here are pretty simple. It's just really one mathematical expression. The functions can be as complicated as they have to be. All right. As I mentioned before, more realistically, in a real example, instead of having a hard-coded value for the currency conversion between yen and pounds and euros, there would be some sort of look up to a database or some call to some other service or something that would give you the, the current conversion rate. All right? So um, don't let the fact that the function is simple throw you. Um, it's simple just because that makes for a simpler example, but that function can be as complicated as possible. The other example I gave is for any sort of business rule calculation, like shipping cost or anything like that. It could be uh, put within a function. So here we have here where you can put in the amount in dollars. You can choose what you want to see converted to. You click convert, and then you get a table showing the results. And what we did last time is We put on the bottom of the page these three functions. Convert dollars to yen, convert dollars to pounds, convert dollars to euros. We give these an argument. Remember, the argument is what the function needs to do its job. If I want to convert dollars to yen, obviously I can't do that unless I know how many dollars you're talking about. So the function needs to be given the number of dollars. The return value is the answer. 
Now, not all functions have return values, but many of them do. And that represents the answer. Sometimes they call functions like this black boxes. Uh, a black box from electrical engineering is where you know what goes in, you know like what wires go in, you know what wire comes out, and you know what happens in the middle even though you don't know the details of what the circuitry is in the middle. Same idea here. This function, we know what goes in, the dollars, we know what comes out, the yen, and the details we don't really care about. All right? We care about it when we're writing the function, but when we're calling the function, all we have to do is make sure that we give the right value and grab the result and do something with it. So our dollars is used as a placeholder because this function could be called from a bunch of different places. All right? So we're, whenever this gets called, we're, we're, we're going to, whatever, however it gets called, whatever value gets passed into it is going to get put in the variable R dollars. We then use that in the calculation, and we return the result. So the function is responsible for taking the inputs, doing whatever process needs to be done, and then giving the output. Whoever calls the function... like up here, is responsible for supplying the input and then doing something with the results. In this case, we're storing the result in a variable called euros, and then later on, we're outputting that value in our table. So the fun whoever calls the function supplies the input, stores the result, and then later on does something with that result. Now, it's not always going to be that the function is going to display on the page the result. Maybe the function, maybe whoever calls the function is going to take that value and use it in some sort of total. You know, maybe it's going to take the, 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 the price of several items, add it together, and give you the result in the end. All right? So, don't, so, so that's why the function simply returns a result. Because it doesn't know, the function itself doesn't know or doesn't care what the result is, uh, what was going to be done with the result. Is it going to be displayed on the page? Is it going to be used in a calculation? Is it going to be used in an if statement? All those things are possibilities. The function doesn't care. The function simply returns a result and whoever is responsible for calling the function then does whatever it needs to with the result. So that's sort of what we had so far. Now, the nice thing is, is we could call these functions anywhere on this page, now that we made functions out of them. We could call it down here. Later on, if we needed to, we could call it again, and so on. The problem is, is if we created a second page that used this conversion, would be out of luck because these functions live on this one page. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do similar to what we've done with CSS and JavaScript, and we're going to put it in its own file. And by putting it in its own file, we can share all that code from page to page to page. All right. So that's going to be my first step. I'm going to take this PHP code and I'm going to cut it out of here. I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to paste it in there and I'm going to save it as I'm going to save it as 
currency that inc. Now, not all include files have to have an inc, but usually that's sort of the convention. That way, if you're looking at your files out on your web server, you can see an INC typically indicates it's an include file as opposed to a complete PHP page. So I'm going to save it as that. Of course, it's going to give me an error because of permissions. So I'm going to go and save it on my desktop and then I'll copy it in. All right, so I put it on the desktop. I'll now copy it in here. All right, now I have to use, I have to put in my process PHP page I have to put a reference to that include file. And I can do it pretty much anywhere I want to. All right. I'm going to do it up here. I could put it at the bottom. I could put it at the very top. Doesn't really matter. Usually, coding-wise, you know, you sort of figure out what you want to do with it and, and just be consistent with it. Actually, I lied. I'm going to put it up here. And I'm going to say the word include. And then I'm going to put in quotes the name of the include file. Which is currency.inc. Think of the include as being an instruction for the web server to sort of copy and paste the contents of the file in there. So when the web server hits this include file, essentially what it does is it takes the contents of this file and just pastes it right in there. So now those functions are part of this page again. So I can call them. But better than that, I can do the same thing for other pages that need this same calculation. And it should still work. All right. This should be sort of familiar to you. The syntax is a little different, but the, the concept is the exact same for us putting a JavaScript file in a separate file or a CSS in its own file. That's going to allow us to use that on multiple different pages as opposed to just having it stuck in one page. All right, and if we look at this, it should ought to still work. So I should be able to put in 200, convert to yen and pounds, convert, and sure enough, it, it gives me the right answer. Now, what can you put in include files? You can put anything in include files that you can put in a regular PHP page. So. For the most part, that means you can put any mix of HTML and PHP that you want. You could also put JavaScript. You could also put CSS in a PHP include file. Typically, though, what you put in there is some mix of PHP and HTML. In this particular case, because I'm bringing in a bunch of PHP functions, I'm bringing in just a bunch of PHP. But I could bring in a mix of HTML if I wanted to. Which means, well, I'll just mention this now and we'll come back to it either, either end of class today or um, 
after spring break. Which means that if we're making an HTML page, we're making a, a, a set of, a, a website, and we want to have a common navigation on every page, even though the navigation is just plain old HTML, I can put that on every one of my pages. In fact, I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go do uh, that now. Actually, I'm going to make a common header, and I'm going to put a common navigation. So I'm going to go in and create a new file. And it's just contains this one, this particular one isn't going to contain any PHP. save that again on the desktop because of the goofy little security issue that we run into here. I'm going to save that as header.inc. I'm going to create another file. That's going to contain some navigation links. actually going to change this from a HTML file to a PHP file. Why? So that I can take advantage of include files. to my two pages that I have, my process page and my form page, and I'm going to include those two include files. So now I go and I request All right. I have a banner and I have an 
navigation on that. I go and I type that in. I have the same banner and save navigation on that. So now we're sort of into the situation that we are with CSS, right? If I want to change this, let's say I want to add established 2015 on the bottom of the header. If I go and do that in the header, I made a mistake. I, I accidentally bumped the key and I put a backslash here. Good news is, is if you correct it in one place, you correct it in both places. All right. So remember way back when you took CISS 216, we talked about making your making a template for your web pages, for your HTML. And I said be very sure that you have all your common HTML in that template because if you change something, if you change something about the navigation or the header or the footer, you have to go back into all your pages and change it once you've started cloning them. Well, with include files, we no longer have that restriction. So what we're going to do is we're going to put any section of common code, so things like the header, the navigation, the footer, Anything that is common between all our pages, HTML-wise, we're going to put in an include file. And the advantage then is, is if we go and need to change it, if, for example, we add a third link, all right, or whatever, all we have to do is go and change the navigation include file, and that third link will be on every page, all right? So... Include files are powerful in that way. And that's why if I'm doing a project, even if I don't have to do anything especially dynamic on the site, I will oftentimes use a PHP site instead of a plain HTML site just so I can take advantage of the include files. Questions over any of this? So again, remember you can put HTML, you can put anything in an include file that you can put in a PHP page. Plain old HTML, a mix of HTML and CSS, or really anything else that you can put in a PHP file. Now, for my next trick, I'm going to make a chart, a conversion chart. All right? The chart is going to look like this. for the value that I've entered in. Here I'm going to have a chart that simply goes from 1 to 100 and shows me $1. How many yen is that? How many pounds is that? How many euros is that? $2. How many yen is that? Power, pounds, euros. Now you might think, gee, I only have 20 minutes or so to do this. That's 100 rows in a table. Well, we're going to use PHP to do that. All right? We're going to write a loop that will loop through and display the rows of the table 100 times, or, or display 100 rows of the table. And what are we going to do to do get the conversion? Well. This is simply going to be a number that goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way to 100. 
And for each of those table cells, we're going to call a function to get the result and display it. Now, I'm going to do it this way. This is the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to mock up a row, a row or two in the table using just plain old HTML. All right, I'm just going to use plain old HTML. I'm going to mock it up. If you remember back uh, last time I said that a, uh, a lot of times in projects in the past, when I've worked as part of a bigger team, the design team would design the way that the page would look, and then the programmers would come in and actually do the actual programming to make it work for real. So I'm going to take that approach here, and I'm going to mock up a table um, that contains these columns and maybe a couple rows, and then I'm going to go in and I'm going to write the, the coding for it. So. I'm going to copy some stuff from my other page, just in the interest of typing, saving the typing rather. So this is going to be the start of my chart. I have my include file for the currency conversion methods. So the nice thing is, is I don't have to rewrite that function. All right. I don't even really have to understand how the function works. Right? Someone else could have written this function, especially if it was a long, complicated function. All I would need to know is what arguments to give it and what it's going to give back. So here's my conversion chart, and I'm going to hard code a table with a row in it. Table. There's a header, and I'm going to hard code a row in the table, just a single data row. I could do three or four rows, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to do one. One dollar. I don't remember the exact value for yen, but it doesn't matter. We're going to be using the function in a minute here, so I can just sort of mock up a value.
there I have it, and I could duplicate this if I wanted to, to, to get the look of a whole table or, or whatever. All right, I'm going to save it. Again, save it to the desktop and copy it over. Oops. And now I have my form and my chart. I click on the chart and chart.html but if I correct it in one place it corrects it everywhere and there we go there we have my hard coded chart now again we can imagine that this looks really pretty and that a designer went and made the world's greatest looking table in here, all right? And it's my job as a programmer just to add the functionality to it. Let's look at this HTML code. Because effectively, Effectively, other than the include file, we're just plain old HTML. What part of this do I need to change? If you can see the line numbers, yell out the line numbers that I need to change. Okay. Okay. The, the, the table headers are pretty much right. Kind of cast this is the same. All right. This is the same. Really, what I want to do is I want to change lines 31 through 36. How do I want to change them? I want to change them two different ways. One way is I want to repeat it a hundred times. Right? I don't want just one row in my table. I want 100 rows in the table. I want to do the conversion for $1, $2, $3, $4, all the way through 100. So the first thing I want to do is I want to include this in some sort of loop that's going to repeat 100 times. What's the second thing I want to do? The second thing I want to do is I want to actually do the calculation instead of having hard-coded numbers. All right? So let's do this one step at a time. Again, if that is one of the main messages I try to impart to students is you don't necessarily have to do everything all at once. Notice in this case even how I'm doing it in steps. The first step, I'm not even writing a PHP page. I'm hard-coding an HTML table just to get the look of it down. Now I'm going to go in and do the next phase of it. I'm going to make it instead of having one table row, it has 100 table rows. Then finally, in the last step, I'm going to actually go and do the calculation. It's so much easier to do that. And you would not believe the number of times like students will show me their code and they'll have a hard time finding an error. And frankly, no wonder they're having a hard time finding an error. I'm having a hard time finding the error in there because they're showing me a gigantic set of code with, you know, dozens of lines in it and the error somewhere in there. Well, where is it? I don't know. It's like a needle on a haystack. If you do a little tiny piece at a time, 
then, hey, if I change one of five lines, if it stopped working, I'm pretty sure that error's in one of those five lines that I just changed. All right? Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a loop so that it creates my table row 100 times. How do you suppose I'm going to do that? I don't really need another include file unless I was going to reuse it. All right. Now, in this case, um, there's no real indication that I would ever need to do exactly this thing again. So I'm not going to create an include file for this. What am I going to do? Well, what allows us to repeat a block of instructions a certain number of times? A loop, right. And specifically in this case, I know the number of times I want to do this, so I'm going to do a for loop. So, I'm going to say four. Dollar sign I equals one. What does that represent? Dollar sign I equals one. The, the, right. The, this is where the variable is going to start out with. All right. In other words, the first trip through the array, I'm sorry, the first trip through the loop, the variable i is going to have a value of 1. sign i less than or equal to 100 represent? How many times it's going to run through? In other words, this is going to continue the loop as long as this is true. So as long as i is less than or equal to 100, we're going to take another trip through the loop. When i gets to be a value of 101, we're going to stop. And we're not going to execute the loop again. I plus plus indicates what? It's going to increase the value of that variable by one each time through. Now we could do in that chart, we could do every 10, right? We could start I off at 10 and then do 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And that might be something you might want to play around with with the example, just to get a little more familiar with loops on how to do that. Okay. Now, this can be a little confusing, but here I'm going to pop out of PHP. Why? Because I have a chunk of HTML I want to output. And here I get back in the PHP mode because I want to close my loop. So notice that the loop starts here. All this stuff is in the part is part of the loop and then boom, that here closes the loop up here. That's one thing that can be confusing about PHP until you get used to it is that you can start a PHP instruction in one PHP block and end it in another. So you can do this with loops, you can do this with if statements, you can do that with um, any sort of statement. So what this is saying effectively is this is the block of statements that's going to get executed 100 times. Another way to put it is we're going to output 100 rows to this table. Now, these rows aren't correct yet, right? I'm not doing any real calculations here. I'm going to have the exact same row duplicated 100 times. 
So we're not done yet, but we're making progress. So let's go and let's look at this. And I hit refresh, and there we go. We have 100 rows. And I ask you to take my word for it and not make me count them. But there's 100 rows here that go, all right. So, our last step is to make this do the actual calculation. And to do that, we're obviously going to need to pop into PHP mode again. All right. What should the value of this cell be? What should I put in here? Okay, so how do I output the value of I? Okay, moving in the right direction, but we need a little bit more. Well, first thing we need to do, and maybe, maybe you assume this, but first thing we need to do is out, get into PHP. What else do we need to do? If I did dollar sign I, would that be enough? No, we already set up I equal to 1 up here. What do we want to do to dollar sign I? We want to output it, right? How, that is, we want to send it to the browser. So what do we do to output something to the browser? Echo. Now again, I'm going to test this now. Even though I know I'm not done, but just to test the progress that I've made. See if I am moving in the right direction. So I'll go and save this and run it. And now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up through 100. So we're making progress with that. All right, what are we going to do here? Well, we need to go into PHP mode. We know that. We know we have to echo something. All right. What is it that we are echoing? What do we want to do? It's the value for yen. How are we going to get the value for yen? We'll call the function and we'll pass it the i variable. So I have to refresh my memory what the name of the function was. Convert dollars to yen. And I could do this a couple different ways. But I'm going to do it this way. Just because it might be more straightforward. Do my calculation and store the result in my variable called yen, and then I'm going to echo yen. All right. And again, this could be done a few different ways, but this is a way that I've chose to do it. Let's test this part out. Again, notice what I'm doing is I'm, I'm literally changing one tiny piece of it, testing it. If something breaks, I know that the thing that I've changed most recently is probably the culprit. All right. 
I should go and do the math, but I'm assuming that this is probably pretty correct. All right. Now, last thing I have to do is I have to do the same thing for euros and dollars. I'm sorry, euros and um, pounds. So, I'm getting bold. But I think we can see based on the other things how this is going to work. consistent, right? Because I'm using the same function. So if I go to my form and put in six dollars, I get six is 5.4, 7, 17, 3.9. I go to my chart, I get the same results. They're in a slightly different order, but I get essentially the same results. Now, if something were to happen and the value of the dollar compared to the yen or, or pound or euro changed, all I need to do is change it in one place. So, again, in a real application, this would probably do some sort of database lookup or call some sort of service to get that. But if the calculation changed, think in terms of shipping calculation or anything like that. All I would need to do is change it in the one place, and that change would be reflected across all pages that used that calculation. So that calculation no longer is tied to one specific page. That calculation um, exists um, across several pages. And again, notice how simply by starting off with a mocked up HTML page, and then slowly looking and adding the PHP, I was able to go in a fairly straightforward manner to create the chart that I wanted to from this. Questions about this? because me and David were kind of talking about this a little bit in lab. Typically, the, the, the biggest benefit for using PHP is for creating the HTML. But there are cases when you could use PHP to create the other stuff too, and you could put it in an include file and all that. Uh, an example of that is like with Angel. With Angel, you can theme your page, right? You can choose a, a color scheme or whatever. In that case, there's a script on the server that creates not just the HTML, but creates the CSS. So, yes, you could, in an include file, you could have the CSS, and you could have the PHP actually choosing between different colors and outputting the CSS and all that. So to answer your question, yes, um, it is possible to do that. Um, and um, I don't know exactly how common it would be, but it certainly is something that, that is workable and is especially beneficial if you want to make like the way the page looks dynamic. In other words, different from user to user. Or if you had a scheme where, depending on the day of the year or the time of the day, 
you could make the page look different, you know. Um, depending on the weather, you could make the page look different. Uh, I, I know sometimes on my, on my phone, depending on how the background's set, my, the background of my phone will look different. Like if it's sunny out, it'll, you'll see a sunshine. If it's rainy out, you'll see drops of water and all that. Well, you could do something similar to that on a web page in a dynamic way. And you could include styling, or you could include the PHP to, to create some of the styling just like it's creating the HTML. So there's certain instances where it's certain, in, certain instances that, you, you, that, that it, you could and it would be a good idea to do that. Other questions? All right. Next week is spring break. All right, so we do not have classes. Um, you can certainly continue to send me um, emails um, over spring break, and I will be working hard to catch up on stuff and planning the second half of the semester and hopefully getting some rest in too. All right. Okay, any questions? We'll see you in lab. Does anyone have a USB drive I can borrow?